Okay, so for the last few weeks, the last few months really, in our messages on Sunday morning, we've been looking at, uh, I guess what you'd call specifics of the Christian life, specifics of Christianity. We've been looking at things like uh, bad habits that are in your life that you need to be able to get out of your life, or good habits you need to be able to add to your life, so on and so forth. We've been looking at specifics. And today, with moving into the new building, kind of a new stage in the life of our church, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. I want to take this opportunity to take a few steps back and kind of get what, uh, what you might call a, a 20,000 foot overview of this thing we're in, this thing called the church, this thing called Christianity. Because again, looking at specifics is great. That's what Jesus did for the majority of his ministry. He looked at specifics of how to live, how to live with your family, how to live with the people around you, how to do this, how to do that. It's, it's great. It's wonderful. I think we've all benefited a lot. But I think it's very important to take time to get the big picture again, to remind myself what we're really involved in. So we're going to do that this morning, and my favorite way to do that is with a question. So here we go. I'm going to ask you a question. Please don't shout out an answer. Just think about it in your head. Why did Jesus Christ come to earth? What did he come to accomplish? You can just think about it for a moment. We all thought about it? Why did Christ come to earth? What did he come to accomplish? Now think about it in a different way. Here's another question. Why does Christianity matter? What, why does it matter, really? Why are we here? Not here on earth, but here in this building. Why does Christianity matter? Have we all thought about it? You know what I find really interesting? If you were to take those two questions, which are very similar questions as far as the way you'd answer them, if you were to take those two questions and ask a hundred random members of the church in the U.S., you would get a very large variety of answers. There's, there's no consensus as far as an answer for those two questions, which is really interesting since those are like probably the two most important questions we could ask ourselves as Christian. Why did Christ come to earth? What did he come to accomplish? Why does Christianity matter at all? There are a few answers, though, I, I think that, that I've encountered a lot. A few answers that are very common in the church today. I'm going to look at two of them really briefly. But one thing you'll hear a lot with the church today as far as answering those questions would be, um, Jesus Christ came to deliver us to heaven. Christianity matters because it is our, our way into heaven, or our way out of hell, as it were, right? How many have encountered that idea? It's, that's a very, very common one in the church. Christ came to get us into heaven, he came to save us out of hell, and that is Christianity, that is why Christ came, that is the gospel. So, let's ask ourselves and just think about it in your head for a minute. Is, is that the gospel? Is that the whole, that's, that's the gospel? Obviously, heaven's a great thing. Obviously, that's a part of the gospel. But is that, is that the whole picture? Did Christ came to give us our, our golden ticket into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory? Did he help us come to make the cut so we don't have to suffer forever in hell? Is that the gospel? Was that the message that Jesus Christ focused on? You know, I don't know, and this is my opinion here, based on what I know about Scripture, but in my opinion, there's no, I think it's one of the biggest perversions of what the gospel is to say that Christ came for the purpose of getting us into heaven, the end. That Christianity matters so you can get into heaven, the end. That's something you're going to encounter a lot, but here's the thing. I have read through Jesus' teachings a lot, and I cannot find the part where he says, it's all about getting into heaven, and if you can do these things, you get into heaven, and that's it. You can make the cut your gold. From what I can tell, heaven was never the focus of Jesus' teaching. It wasn't. What we do have, though, I love when the Bible gives us bits of the answer, just outright states it, so we don't have to search around too much. In Matthew uh, chapter 1, there's an angel who is speaking uh, to Jesus' parents, and he's basically explaining what, Je or what Jesus is going to do. The angel says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from... Dot, 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 fill in the blank. From hell? He will save them to heaven? Let's, let's get the actual thing up here. 
You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What is sin? Well, that's something that's in our lives right now, right? I'm not talking about heaven or hell here. He's talking about stuff in your life right now. It doesn't say hell, and it could have. So that's number one that I've encountered a whole lot. Jesus came to deliver us into heaven. We'll talk about more, more of that in a moment. But the other, the other thing I've encountered a lot as far as an answer to the question, why did Jesus come to earth, or why does Christianity matter, is this. Jesus came to die and to secure our forgiveness. Obviously, I mean, that, that's, that's huge right there, right? Forgiveness, I don't think there's anyone who would debate that forgiveness is a core part of the gospel, right? Now, forgiveness is huge. I, uh, there's a bumper sticker I've seen in the wild quite a few times. I get one of those Christian bumper stickers. Tell me if you've seen it as well. It says, Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. Ever seen that one? A couple people? I've seen it a, a good few times. Maybe like five or six times just out, you know, driving around. Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. Which I mean, okay, like technically speaking, I've never known a perfect Christian. And I have known a lot of Christians who are forgiven. So, okay, great. There's a, there, I have a beef with this, though. I really, I have a serious beef with it. Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. You know what that communicates to the rest of the world? It says, hey, my life is just as dysfunctional and messed up and awful as everyone else's. But I've got the stamp of forgiveness on my forehead. That's what that communicates. It says, hey man, the whole world's messed up, and Christians are no different. We're messed up too. We have terrible, messed up, dysfunctional lives. But we have forgiveness, and you can have that stamp too on your messed up, terrible life. That's what that communicates right there. So let's ask ourselves the question, is that the message that Jesus brought? Hey, sin is still going to be your master, guys but you will be forgiven. Your life is going to be really messed up and miserable, full of sin and dysfunction. Your relationships are going to be dysfunctional and hard to deal with at the best. You're never going to find peace. You're never going to find joy. You'll never find fulfillment in this life. Your lives are just going to be just like everyone else's, messed up, but at least you have forgiveness. Was that Jesus' focus? Now again, from what I can tell, forgiveness is a huge part of the gospel. It's huge. I don't think you can separate forgiveness from the gospel. But I think there's a bit more to it than that. The Apostle Paul, I think, gives us a nice picture of why Jesus came to die in uh, his letter to his disciple Titus, my son's namesake, by the way. Titus chapter 2, he says this, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, what, what, is, what does that imply? That he said, Jesus gave himself to get our forgiveness, the end, for the sake of forgiveness. Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness. What does that mean? What does to redeem mean? To pull something out of? What is lawlessness? That's the sin and the junk and the dysfunction in our lives. Jesus gave himself to pull us out of that. So what's his concern? Our lives right now. He's concerned with our lives right now. And what's really cool to me, and I love it when the Bible does this, again, it just gives us the answer to the question, why did Jesus come? Or what was he trying to accomplish? Why does Christianity matter? In John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He's talking about a life that's entirely different from what the world says is normal, from what the world says is okay, a life that's entirely different from what we're used to, 
a life that's entirely better than what we're used to. He's talking about our lives, like the ones that we know and we live and we're living right now. So I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. And that's not me adding on a mission statement under what Jesus did. This is Jesus. These are his words. This is his mission statement. I came for this reason, that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so the good news, the message of Jesus Christ is really an invitation. It's an invitation um, into the kind of life that we were created to live. The kind of life that's, uh, that's full life and rich life. Life that's abundant. Life as it was meant to be. Which sounds pretty cool to me. And if you look at his teaching, if you just read through the Gospels and <clears throat> read what Jesus Christ taught and what he was concerned with. What you're going to see over and over and over again is him showing people how to live in different spheres and areas of life. How to live in relationships, how to live with the people around you, how to do this, how to do this. That's like 99% of the stuff he talked about was how to live, telling human beings how to live their lives. Not saying you can do this, 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 you get into heaven. Whatever you do, just make the cut to get into heaven and you're good. Or this is this and you've got forgiveness and who cares about what your lives look like after that? Jesus was concerned about with how they lived because according to him, his purpose was to help people live life abundantly. Um, yeah, how many, you, you've all heard the term the gospel, right? Well, what does that word mean? Anyone know? The good news. What is the good news? Like what? Like, okay, I mean, there's like the good news, like Christian term. But like, if I'm like, hey, what good news do you have to give me, Christian? What is the good news? The good news, according to Jesus, is that abundant life is available to human beings. And that's really good news. And I'll get to that more in a moment here. But just think about this for a minute. Uh, have you ever wondered why Jesus is still a dominant figure in the world 2,000 years later? Why he's still so extremely relevant? Jesus, his enduring relevance is based on his historically proven ability to speak to, to heal, and to empower the individual human condition. He's relevant because of what he brings to the table and what he continues to bring to the table for the ordinary person living an ordinary life, in an ordinary time, with an ordinary job, in an ordinary home, he's relevant because he offers something better for them than what they're used to. He has a promise of something more full and more whole and more abundant. And that's really good news. It, it's very good news for a world that has no hope. And much of the world does have no hope. So I, I think it's, uh, again, I, I want to take this opportunity today to take a few steps back and get the, the big picture of what we're doing. It's great to look at specifics. Again, that's what Jesus did, and we're going to continue to do that. But it's important to get the big picture sometimes, to see what this whole thing is all about. But I do think we, we throw around words like um, the abundant life or life as it was meant to be or the good news, or the gospel, or, or whatever, and sometimes uh, as Christians, they become what you call Christianese words, you kind of become jaded to those terms, and they stop really having a whole lot of meaning. I think it's important to well, uh, frequently, I guess, examine what that stuff is all about and really get the picture again, which is what we're doing this morning. So I want to take a moment to look at this whole abundant life thing, to briefly look at this abundant life and look at why the abundant life is good news to humanity. Why it's something that's worthwhile. Why it's something that matters to humanity 2,000 years ago and today and will continue mattering tomorrow. I've narrowed it down to three, three short reasons here. The reasons why the abundant life, the life that Jesus came proclaiming, matters. Why it's such good news. Reason number one, the abundant life is available to us, us, now, and here, 
in our regular lives. It's available to us to actually start living. Not as some kind of abstract reality, not as like a, that's a nice thought, as a real thing that we can actually start living out. I think one of the most, one of the coolest things about the, the life that Jesus led on earth was the fact that like, he lived it for the most part as, like, as a regular guy. I mean, okay, so there's the Gospels. This is Jesus' ministry on earth. But do you know how old he was when he started launching out, or when he launched out on that ministry? He was roughly 30 or so, give or take three years. It's roughly 30. You know what he was doing for 30 years before that? He was just living a life as a guy, regular guy with a regular family, regular parents in a regular home, working a regular job like any other Jewish boy growing up would do. Did you guys know that Jesus had siblings? How many of you knew that? Did you know he had a lot of siblings? Everyone thinks of like, okay, there's James. But did you know he had four brothers and at least two sisters? Maybe more, you know. Maybe there are ten sisters in there. Jesus was a member. He was one of many kids. Can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your brother? Mom, Jesus turned my water into wine again. Make him stop. I mean, seriously, though, I mean... Jesus was a guy. It's really hard for us to imagine it because we read about his ministry and the miracles. But prior to all that, he was just a, a guy, a kid. Parents and siblings. Can you imagine Jesus receiving like instruction? No, Jesus. Stop bothering your brothers and sisters. It's really interesting to think about. He was just a guy. He lived a life. And that's what's so profound about Jesus Christ coming and living lives like all of us do. The fact is, he experienced the same kinds of temptations we're going through today. Temptation hasn't changed, guys. The medium of temptation, sure. The sin habits, like the, the way they're played out, sure. But sin is the same now as it was 2,000 years ago. Jesus had to deal with it. It was in his face like everyone else. Yet he managed to live a life that was rich and full and fulfilling and highly functional despite all of that stuff. And here's the thing. If Jesus came today... If Jesus came today, he could be like an accountant or a banker or an engineer or a car salesman. He could be an automobile mechanic. He could run a cleaning service. He could be a lab technician. He could do whatever, and none of it would be any hindrance to the life that he led. He could live in your surroundings, in your family, in your time, with your education and your life prospects, with your paycheck, and none of it would hinder him living the kind of life that he led, the kind of abundant life that he led, the kind of abundant life that's available to us through him now. And that's what's so cool about this whole thing is we're not talking about some abstract thing. Someday, when I get to heaven, oh, I can't wait to get out of this earth and get to heaven and then things will be better. The whole message of Jesus Christ is, I came that you may have life, real life, abundantly, now. This whole thing. And we really mess up when we say, oh, it's all about heaven, or it's all about just forgiveness and forget about how your life looks now. Jesus was actually concerned about how your life looks now. And that's what's so cool about how awesome the abundant life is and why it's such good news and why it matters. That's number one. It's available to us, and not just us sitting in this room, there's not a single human being on the earth that has disqualified themselves from the kind of life they were designed to live. There is no point that's too far. It's available to every single one of us as a way of living. That's awesome. That is extremely good news. So that's number one. The number two reason why the abundant life is awesome, why it is great news, why it matters, is this. The abundant life is functional. Life as it was meant to be lived, the abundant sort of life, generally just works a whole lot better than any other alternative way of living. There's this thought within the church today that God gave his laws and commandments, like God tells us what to do, 
And those things are either arbitrary, like do this because I told you to, or impossible to follow. Like, here are some laws I know you can never live up to, and I'm going to punish you for not living up to them. So, gotcha. They're either arbitrary or impossible to follow. And in, in reality, if you go back to the Old Testament and you look at the point where God started laying down all these laws for his people, his intentions are explicitly stated as being for our good, always. Moses says it. He's like, God told us to do these things for our own good. It's in Deuteronomy 6 and in Deuteronomy 5, God himself says, Oh, if you would only listen to the things I'm telling you to do, everything would go well for you, always. He actually says that. Only you would listen to my commandments. I'm telling you what to do because it's good for you to do it. It is literally like the parent that says to their child, don't touch the hot stove. That's literally how it works. The kid's like, don't tell me how to live my life. I do what I want. Yeah! <laughs> Parents are like, I knew you were going to hurt your hand because I know how a stove works and I know how the hand works. I knew you were going to hurt yourself. God's going, I, I told you, like, I, I clearly told you what to do. If you would just do those things, everything would go well for you. If only you would follow my commandments. They're given for our good always. And that's how, that's. That is the gospel right there. That's the abundant life. It's living under the instruction of God's laws for us, not because it's like, okay, and now I have God's protection and he'll bless me if, he, if I do what, I, what he tells me to do. Not just because of those reasons, but it's literally we are designed in a specific way and there are some ways of living that are going to work and some other ways are just not going to work. Historically speaking, selfishness and hatred has pretty much always resulted in some bad stuff for humankind, right? can't think of a whole lot of areas where selfishness has really played out to be a good thing. Historically speaking, unconditional love pretty much always resulted in some pretty good stuff for mankind. That's because we're designed to live in a certain way. God's like, I told you how to do that thousands of years ago. What's really neat to me is um, if you look in if you look in the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, one of the, one of the mantras you hear over and over again, one of the repeated uh, frangs, uh, frangs. It's a new word. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know, I'm sorry. Highly theological speak. I'm just too, you know. you gotta dumb down my language a little bit for the layman. Frangs, don't look that up, don't call me on that. One of the repeated phrases in Matthew, you see, is repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see it in, um, in chapter 3, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 4. You see it a few different places. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know what that translates to in everyday speech? Is hey, there's another way of living that's available to you now. So you need to really reconsider the way you're living your life because there's something better available. Stop living this way. Something better is available to you. If that is Christ's focus, if that's the way he went about it, I don't want to go away about it any other way. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hey, stop living like that. You're hurting yourself. There's something better available to you right now. That's how he went about it. It's a call for us to reconsider how we approach living life. There's a better way to do it. That's number two. It is functional. It generally just works better. Number one, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry. Number one, it is available to us now, all of us, wherever we're at. Number two, it is highly functional. It just works better. And finally, number three, the number three reason why the abundant life is worthwhile, why it matters, why it is such good news to humanity. It is fulfilling. It is fulfilling. It brings peace and it brings joy like nothing else in existence. The cry of this world is, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. The thing that'll satisfy me. 
the thing that will fill me up. There's a restlessness in humankind. How then shall I live? And Jesus' response, John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's not talking about literal hunger and thirst there. He's talking about a matter of fulfillment and peace and joy that can only be found in him and the life that he invites us to participate in. Nothing else, nothing else works like the abundant kind of life works. Our planning team, uh, our planning leadership team, earlier this week we were meeting, we were discussing this message as we, as we were planning it. Um, and Canaan, our, our worship leader, my brother, uh, he said, he, he remarked, he said, um, he said, the best times in my life have been those times where I've been living under the instruction of Jesus Christ. Like the best times in my life have been the ones where I've been living that kind of abundant life. The best times in my marriage, the best times in my friendships. Things just work better. It brings peace, it brings, there's a joy to it. It's fulfilling. And we have this idea like, okay, I know it's a good idea to live for God, but I want to enjoy my life first. I want to live it up first and enjoy what the world has to offer. I, 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 I'm, I'm, okay, maybe you can't relate with me there, but when I was 15, 16, 17, I literally thought those exact things. I know I should live for God. Maybe when I'm like 30 and can no longer, by definition, have fun, <laughs> maybe then I'll give my life to God and, you know, I know it's better for me and I, it'll be boring, but then I'll, then I'll give my life to God after I've lived it up. We have this idea like our human life will be destroyed by the life God has to offer, when in reality it is fulfilled in the life God has to offer and only in the life God has to offer. I'll, I'll just put it this way. I am having the most fun I've ever had in my entire life right now. Not, I mean, you know, like right now. <laughs> but in, at this point in my life, I'm, I have so much fun. And it's not about, you know, come to God, you'll have so much fun. Uh, you know, this is not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I, I love my life. I love it so much. I love walking with God and walking in his instruction in a way that my life is functional. My marriage is functional. My family is functional. My friendships are functional. My mind is functional. It's great. And just overall, the funnest people I know are the ones that are walking in the instruction of God. The most enjoyable, neatest people I know are the ones that are full and fulfilled and walking in abundant sorts of life. So our human lives, it's not a matter of, you know, uh, my life will be destroyed and I won't, live, have, I won't have fun anymore. And that's it for me. They're fulfilled only in the life God has to offer for us because that's how we were designed. You don't think walking in our design is going to result in the most fun, the most creative, most everything. It, it's the superlative of every good thing you can imagine that we see a reflection of here on earth. That's what the abundant life is all about, and that's why it's so stinking cool. That's number three. It is fulfilling. It gives peace, and it brings joy. So for the next few weeks, we're going to take a, take a quick look at how the abundant life plays out in our spheres of living. The two biggest ones is the abundant life looks a certain way in dealing with people, and the abundant life looks a certain way in how you relate with God. So we're going to look at those in the coming weeks. But that is the message of Christianity. It's an invitation to a life that's better. Repent, because something better is at hand. Repent literally means walking one way, turning, and walking another way. You break down the Hebrew word, it's what it means. It's like, hey, I know you're living this way. There's something better. Turn around. Come this way. It's a better path. We're given an invitation. And it's not an invitation that is limited to us because what's cool is God, it's actually stated, God desires every single person on earth to come to him. 
That is why Jesus Christ came to earth. That's what he came to accomplish. That's why Christianity matters. And that is everything else we talk about is under, it's a subcategory of what we're talking about right now. It is. This consists of relating with God rightly, relating with people rightly. And that's life. You can get those two things right. You've got it. So we're going to have the band come back up here <clears throat> as we close here. But I, I, I just want to pray for all of us here. Um, what, like, as I mentioned, what we've been doing for the past few weeks on Sunday mornings is looking at different aspects of how to live the Christian life. The Christian life is just another word for the abundant sort of life that Christ came to deliver us into. And it's a matter of how we choose to live. That's, how, that's Christ's message. He says, live this way. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. So I just want to pray that all of us, if we're, if we're not currently living in that sort of lifestyle, that we begin to start seeking it. And if we are attempting to live it, that God would strengthen us to continue living it. Because it can be hard, because the world doesn't cooperate often. So Father... Thank you so much that you offer us something better, something so much better. Thank you that you don't leave us to our dysfunction and our squalor. Thank you that you reach down and you offer us life as it was meant to be. God, you care enough. Father, I pray for those of us who have no idea what that's all about. God, I pray that you'd help us to get started and start walking down that, that path to something better. And for those of us who are trying to live it out right now, God, I pray you would help us. You would walk alongside us. You'd remind us that we're not in this alone. I'm so grateful to you, Father.